Uh, it is my pleasure to talk to you about the one and only Johnny Carson today. Uh, I can really say uh, that I'm sure a lot of you know a lot about Johnny Carson, but again, my goal always is to bring you bits of information about, in this case, this great man that you might not have known before. So that's what we'll do for the first part, and then of course for the second, I brought along some wonderful, wonderful clips that will probably rekindle a lot of memories concerning the great Mr. Carson. So. The one with the hatchet? Interesting that you mentioned that because yes, that is one of them. So the one with the hatchet that she's talking about actually took place years ago, in the 60s if I'm not mistaken, and she's talking about it like it just happened yesterday. Yeah, but that was the longest laugh that had ever been on television. It was an incredibly long laugh, and, and you'll hear it again tonight, plus a lot more. So thank you for bringing that up. Yes, that is one of the many ones that I brought. Uh, so anyway, folks, anybody here uh, hearing me speak for the very first time? Anyone? Oh, really, you look actually very familiar. You just must have those kind of faces. Have you ever seen me before? No. No? You say that with some authority. <laughs> you might wish you never had after this. But for you, my name is Robert Landau, originally from New York City. I am now a professional public speaker. Uh, by way of the cruise industry, actually, was a professional cruise director uh, for close to 10 years, 300 ports of call on close to 400 cruises. Uh, it is my pleasure now to be bringing you this series, among others, uh, having to do with America's greatest comedians. I don't pretend to be an expert in anything that I speak about. Rather, I love to research and I love to find things that are not ordinarily known about the people that I speak about. So we'll do a little bit of everything here and talk about the life and career of the great Johnny Carson. And with that in mind, I'd like to start off with a question for you, everybody. What images, words come to mind when you hear the name Johnny Carson? Karnak, Karnak the Magnificent, that's right. What else? We heard the, the hatchet clip, which is a very good one. Anything else? The monologue. The monologue, the monologue at the beginning of every show. What else? Somebody said something over here. Ed McBan. And? Here's Johnny. Here's Johnny, that's right. That's right, very important. What else? It's interesting because as you're giving these up, you're also smiling a lot. And I love to see that. That, that about says everything right there. The car salesman. The car salesman. The car salesman. That's right. What else? The late night announcer for the movies. Yeah, one of those, I think the name was Art Fern, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, what else? Anything else? Words that come to mind for me when you hear the name Johnny Carson are fun and joy. Fun and joy. Why? because that's what I remember when I would watch the Johnny Carson show night after night after night. I know, hopefully like you did, that I would laugh no matter how bad my day had been. If nothing else was going right in my life, at least I knew that I could count on the joy and fun and laughter that I would get from watching The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. And that is really, really saying something if you think about it. Johnny Carson was an anchor for me. And I'm not talking about a news anchor. I'm actually talking about a psychological anchor. He was always there. He was always also on a very even keel emotionally. Uh, 
I could depend on him because of who he was. Little did I know, actually, that what I was watching was actually somebody who would have an amazingly profound influence on American entertainment and American culture. Somebody once said this, on the good nights, he was the second best thing you could do in bed. But on his best nights, he was simply the best. Here are some other things that other people have said about the great Johnny Carson. The first one goes like this. He was the greatest talk show host of our time with the quickest mind. One of the greatest thrills of my career was not on stage, but when Johnny called me after seeing me host the Oscars and telling me how much he actually loved what I did, that's how much I looked up to him. He was a true idol. Words spoken by Billy Crystal. Here's another one. I don't think his work will ever be topped. I think he was the world's greatest host. He did so many creative things on that show. He used to have sketches that were absolutely hilarious. And when a joke died, he was funnier than ever. It was the plum show to be on for big, big stars. They all hungered to go on with Johnny Carson because he always treated everyone so well and brought out the very best in them. Those words spoken by Phyllis Diller. Here's another one. No single individual has had as great an impact on television as Johnny. Words spoken by Jay Leno. Here's another one. He was the most decent, marvelous man I've ever known. I think that Johnny, no matter how long he lived in Hollywood, and no matter how much money he ended up making, he still had a piece of straw stuck in his ear. Words spoken by Jerry Lewis. And here's one more. Goes like this. Johnny Carson was the public face of American comedy for decades. But anyone who knew him well knew that he was an intensely private and yet deeply generous man. So many of us who are working in show business today owe our careers to him. I was his last guest, and it was one of the most moving experiences of my life. He had it all, a little bit of devil, a whole lot of angel, with charm, good looks, superb timing, and great, great class. Those words spoken by Bette Midler. Here are some words that were spoken by Johnny Carson himself, and I've broken them up into two categories, one humorous, one serious. Let's start out with the funny side. Johnny once said this, happiness is your dentist telling you it won't hurt and then having him catch his hand in the drill. <laughs> Here's another one. Mail your packages early so the post office can lose them in time for Christmas. Here's another. If variety is the spice of life, marriage is the big can of leftover spam. Here are some more. The difference between a divorce and a legal separation is that a legal separation gives a husband time to hide his money. And one more, if life was fair, Elvis would be alive and all the impersonators would be dead. <laughs> On the serious side, he's famous for saying these, talent alone won't make you a success. Neither will being in the right place at the right time unless you are ready. The most important question then is, are you ready? Here's another one. 
Never continue in a job you don't enjoy. If you're happy in what you're doing, you'll like yourself, and then you'll have inner peace. And if you have that, along with physical health, you will have had more success than you could possibly have ever imagined. And here's the last. The only thing money gives you is the freedom of not worrying about money. Anybody know his given name? His given name? It's really not widely known. His given name, folks, is John William Carson. John William Carson. And he was born in Corning, Iowa on October 23rd, 1925. At eight years of age, Johnny's folks, his brother, and his sister moved to Norfolk, Nebraska. And if you think Johnny was a shy kid, you're actually very mistaken. Johnny was fairly outgoing, and with that, he absolutely loved to entertain people. Whether it was doing Popeye imitations, which he did very well, or trying to be the funny guy in school and in social situations, Carson realized where he needed to be and what he needed to be doing at a very early age. Soon, Johnny magically transformed himself into the great Carsoni. The great Carsoni, and he started to do magic tricks uh, and shows for his mother's bridge club and various church groups. And actually, he was quite an accomplished magician. On December 7th, 1941, uh, that was a date that would not only be important in Johnny's life, but also in the lives of every single American at the time. December 17th, 1941, was what? Yes, the date that the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. Johnny was a high school senior and decided upon graduation that it would probably be best if he would join the Navy. He served for about three years, and if you didn't think he would end up entertaining the troops during his three-year stint with the Navy, you are sadly mistaken again. Johnny and Eddie were a team. They were a performing duo. Anybody want to guess who Eddie was? He was a ventriloquist. Very good. Eddie was a dummy. He was a real dummy because of that. Did you all hear what she said? He was also not only an accomplished magician, but also an accomplished ventriloquist. And Eddie was his dummy. Uh, so, they would perform, and of course, the troops absolutely loved what they saw. After the war, Johnny attended the University of Nebraska at Norfolk, and he would graduate in 1949 with a major in speech and radio and a minor in physics. His thesis, I love the title of his thesis, and that was How to Write comedy jokes. Interesting title, actually. That's a thesis that I would love to have read, actually. Uh, and he studied for this thesis very closely the, the talents and careers of the great Bob Hope and Milton Berle, just to name a few. His career really began in 1950 at a radio and television station in Omaha, Nebraska. He would eventually find himself hosting a morning TV program called The Squirrel's Nest. And if you want to further your fledgling career in broadcasting, folks, do you stay in Omaha, Nebraska? No. Where do you pick up and move to? New York. How about the other coast? California, 
L.A. in Johnny's case, and that's exactly what occurred. Carson worked at L.A. TV station KNXT, which was a CBS affiliate. Uh, there, he would create his own comedy sketch show by the name of Carson's Cellar. A certain funny man was watching this show with great interest and decided to ask Carson to be a writer on this guy's very successful comedy TV show. Anybody want to guess who that might have been? Ooh, who said that? Very good. I was going to give you a hint. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Red Skelton. Red Skelton, that's right, but he, he beat me to the quick. <laughs> it's funny. It's funny how that happens because it just happened again. Two weeks ago, I did a presentation at another venue on Lucille Ball, and we were talking about what characteristics made Lucille Ball very unique. And just when I was talking about that, out of the whole large crowd of people, there was one lady whose hair was dyed the same color as Lucille Ball's was. And I was standing right in front of her like this when I was talking about her. So I said, and what else makes Lucille Ball very unique? <laughs> she was right there. It was great. And then when we established that fact, she said to me, well, you know, a lot of people mistake me for Lucille Ball. <laughs> well, I'm not sure about that, but her hair was close, so. <laughs> anyway, Red Skelton, that's right. Johnny became a writer for the Red Skelton show, which started a lifelong friendship between the two. Now Johnny was getting to be known as a host for television shows as well as a writer as well as a comic guest. In 1954, Johnny would host a game show called Earn Your Vacation. I love the titles of some of these early game shows, Earn Your Vacation. Would you appear on Earn Your Vacation? Yeah? <laughs> I think I would if Johnny Carson was hosting it. From 1955 to 1956, uh, there was something called the Johnny Carson Show. Then he was also a panelist a number of times on a, I guess you could call it a game show. I'm sure many of you have seen it. Uh, a little show by the name of To Tell the Truth. The truth, that is right. And from 1957 to 1962, he hosted a game show called Who Do You Trust? Where he met someone that would figure prominently in the rest of Johnny Carson's career. That certain someone was? Ed McMahon. Ed McMahon. Ed McMahon. This is a very responsive side of this room here. <laughs> maybe if I, st you know, maybe if you sat over here, you could spark <laughs> that, that side of the room. With the oh, wait a minute, this isn't the Lucille Ball presentation. No, 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 That's no, right, no, I'm no, sorry, no. I forgot. That's right. Ed McMahon, of course, you guys are right. All of these TV appearances, though, folks, were just dabbles compared to the huge and lasting splash that Johnny would soon make on TV screens across the country. A show would be offered to him as its current host was about to depart. Ah, my goodness, that's right. What was the name of the show? The Tonight Show. Who was departing? You said it. This side of the room is coming back. It's coming back. I can feel it. You can stay where you are. That's OK. Jack Parr, that's right. Who did Jack Parr replace on that show earlier? Steve Allen, that's right. Now, was Johnny up for the challenge? You better believe he was. So in October, 
1962, Johnny Carson assumed the helm of a show that would end up making television history. The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. And I have an utterly ridiculous question to ask you right now. Is there anybody in this room that has not seen The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson? Good, because I was about to say if anybody was going to raise their hand, I would grow hair. <laughs> Thank God. No, hey, hey, it's too late. It's way too late. Sorry. It's all about timing, you know. It's all about timing. <laughs> so, of course, who would be his sidekick on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson? Ed McMahon. And he would, Ed, Start each show by announcing the show, right? And then, you said it before, what would he say as he was introducing Johnny? Here. Say it again. Here. Oh, we have some really good people doing that. You know what? I want to I try something, just because you're such a great group. Um, hold on. <laughs> Okay, let's move on. No, uh, I want to do a, a little contest to see what kind of talent we have here. What do you say? Okay, okay careful, you don't know what it is. <laughs> let's all dye our hair red and see how much we can look like Lucy. Oh, never mind. <laughs> wrong talk again. I don't know what's wrong with me tonight. Uh, I heard a number of you do a really good, here's Johnny. And I want to find the person who does it the best, because if they are here, they will get a complimentary copy of my latest book called How to Make Customer Service Fun, one of three that I've written. It's a shameless little ploy to publicize <laughs> stuff, but what the heck. So uh, <laughs> should I dye my hair red and just leave? No, I like you just the way you are. You like me just the, oh, <laughs> mom, you are just the best. <laughs> You're just the best. <laughs> Thanks for coming tonight. Finally, you came to something I do, for heaven's sake. <sighs> I, I've never seen her before in my life, actually. <laughs> okay, very quickly, we have to pay the orchestra overtime if we don't hustle along here. You know how unions are. Uh, so. Here's Johnny. Who would like to enter themselves in this contest? And you don't even have to stand up and just do a Here's Johnny. I heard some good ones. Don't be afraid. It's just us. This book is sensational. And you will love reading it. It's worth at least a Here's Johnny. Here's Johnny. Well, okay, stand up. Oh, <laughs> do it one more time. Here's Johnny. Excellent. Excellent. I'll ask you to rate them. Uh, who, <laughs> that was good. Uh, who, who else? Who else? No one else. Here's Johnny. Well, stand up. They have to I'm see you. Up. You're not standing up? <laughs> you heard it. But Ed McMahon didn't sit down when he did that. Why should you? Oh, come on. There we go. Here's Johnny. Very good. Very good. See, that wasn't so bad. Anybody else? It's a tie. <laughs> but I only brought one book. <laughs> That's okay, I can bring another one, it's no problem. Anybody else? Okay, uh, uh, gentlemen, if I could have you stand up, we're just going to, just one more time. You don't have to do anything, just stand there. Okay, by your applause, let's do this. Uh, no, 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 not again. Now just remember how they did, okay? And, and I'll have you rate them by the, the, the volume of your applause. <laughs> this is contestant A. This is contestant B. By your applause, let's hear it for contestant A. <laughs> By your applause, let's hear it for contestant B. <laughs> By your applause, let's hear it for the lady with the red hair. <laughs> okay. 
you know what, it is a tie. And both of you come to these series, so I'll give you both a book, but I only have one tonight. So are you coming back again? I'm sure I will. Even after this? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Definitely. Yeah. All right, then I owe you a book, and here's one Thank for you. you. Could we have a round of applause for both of these guys? <laughs> Could we have a round of applause for the lady with the red hair? They love you. You're a star. Ma, what do you think about that? Oh, she's great. She is great. I agree. You always had good taste. After all, you had me. Oh, exactly. That's right. So, where was I? What talk is this? Oh, okay, yes. Yes, a oh, Gene Krupa, that's right. Ah, okay. Think about it, folks. What an amazing show The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson actually was. So I'm sure you all remember the format. We've talked about it briefly. Ed would start the show and introduce Johnny with what we just heard so well by these two wonderful contestants. Then Johnny would come out and do what? His monologue. His monologue. What would he always do, I think just about every time, if I'm not mistaken, at the end of his monologue? Swing a golf club. That's 100% correct, right? And then there might be a skit. We've talked a little bit about that. And then, of course, the guests would appear, and Johnny would work to bring out the best, not in him, but in each and every guest that he welcomed to sit next to him. Speaking of skits, and we've talked a little bit about this, can anyone remember the bunch of characters that Carson ended up entertaining us with for so many years? So uh, you were talking about Karnak the Magnificent, right? And then there was Art Fern as well. Anyone else? Brandy. Yes, and uh, well, uh, Aunt Blabby. Aunt Blabby. Was there something? Did you say something? No? Uh, anyone else? Anyone else? There was Art Fern and many, many more. So let's cut away from all of this for just a moment or two. What do you think, folks, Johnny Carson was really like behind the scenes? First, do you think he was any different than what you saw in front of the camera? You think he was the same person? By a show of hands, how many think that that might be the case? That he was the same, that he was the same person whether he was on or off a stage or in front of the camera. Many of you. How many think that he was not the same? How many really don't care what he was like <laughs> off camera at all? <laughs> Actually, many people often said that Johnny was a little different than what you saw on television. He was rumored to be very shy, very sensitive, not very social at all, temperamental sometimes, and at times just a little emotionally distant. But you know what? Any of those don't have to be a negative if you think about it. And why not? Because when you really think about it, do you really think it was easy being Johnny Carson most of the time. Probably not, is my guess. And it is often said that Johnny was so antisocial, and I don't know that this is true, but this is what I kept finding in the research, that he never once invited Ed McMahon to his home. Isn't that interesting? If that's true. Did you read that too? Yeah, I, I, I find that difficult to believe, but very interesting. No, but no. It's, he was so quiet until. Did you hear what he said? Because Ed McMahon was a klepto. Uh, why didn't you stand up and do a Here's Johnny? I think you would have been a viable contender with those two over there. No, I'll tell you why. I think Johnny was such a consummate professional that he considered relating to Ed McMahon as something that he did in front of the cameras. And maybe, has nothing to do with Ed, he just wanted a break from that when the cameras weren't rolling. And he would retreat into the privacy of his own home, his own world, and maybe not invite too many of the people who comprised his professional world 
into that of his private. It's my guess. I don't want to say that as fact. Uh, Phyllis Diller would say often that when you would see Johnny Carson at a party, at a Hollywood party, he would be totally antisocial. He really wouldn't sit and talk to anybody, and oftentimes he would just be alone or maybe talk to one person in a corner. And she saw this a lot with him. So many people aren't who they present themselves to be when they are on screen. I mean, look at me. Right. Right, <laughs> yes. Because of that, folks, it is my contention that people who make a living in the glaring social spotlight are anything but behind the scenes. And to me, it's kind of how you balance things. Many of you know that I was a professional cruise director for close to 10 years. That was, and I've said this many times, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for a minimum contract of nine months without one day off. Do you think I would feel social when I would have my time off? Or do you think I'd want to be social when I got home and I thought I might have three weeks to rest? Absolutely not. I had to balance all the hysteria and wonderfulness of a high energy career like that with absolutely nothing when I had downtime. And my guess is that Johnny Carson was very much the same way. Also, folks, it might look easy interviewing people. But I assure you, it is not always the case. Uh, it might look easy doing a funny monologue each and every night for so many years, but I can also assure you that that is not the case. It might look easy smiling in front of the camera every night, but I can also assure you that that is not the case. When Dennis Miller first tried to interview people on television, he failed miserably. Shortly after Dennis's phone rang, and it was the great Johnny Carson himself that had called Dennis. Johnny said, not as easy as it looks, Dennis, is it? But he was very kind when he said that. He actually called him to support him because he knew what Dennis was going through. As Johnny Carson, it would have been up to you to keep your ratings high so sponsors would continue to be interested in the show and the show would stay on the air. That is pressure. Not only that, but if you think The Tonight Show was all fun and games all the time, Think again, folks. I don't know how many of you might remember this one single incident that occurred when Johnny, one night, suddenly in the middle of that show, pulled out a copy of the National Enquirer and asked his audience uh, if he could get serious with them for a moment or two. The studio audience then got so quiet you could almost hear a pin drop. Why? Because that was not a common question that Johnny would ask of his audiences. Johnny looked into the camera then and spoke the following words. I have not seen this until this morning. Now, don't forget, he's holding a copy of the National Enquirer. And he goes on to say, now, before I get into this or say more, I want to go on record right here in front of the American public because this is the only form that I have. They have this publication. I have this show. This is absolutely completely, 100% falsehood. I'm going to call the National Enquirer and the people who wrote this liars. Now that is slander. They can sue me for slander. You know where I am, gentlemen. And that sent shudders <laughs> through people's TV. I can only imagine how the audience must have felt that night. What does that say to the world? To me, it says, don't mess around with Johnny Carson. Johnny married three times. 
Johnny has three sons. Unfortunately, Richard died in 1991 as a result of a horrific car accident. And as you can imagine, it took Johnny a long time to uh, at least attempt to get over the shock of having to deal with something like that. Here's a question for you. Folks, what do you think it is about Johnny that kept us watching him for all of those years. What would you say his appeal was? Or do you think he even had any? How does somebody like that, or anybody like us, become that successful for so long each and every night? What, what would you say it was? Fresh material. Fresh material. Fresh material. Huh? Personality. Personality. Charisma. Charisma. Not me, him. <laughs> oh, you are talking about him. I'm sorry. Yes. What else? What else? It was positive. It was not negative. Yes. Very much so. It was positive always. Very rarely, if ever, was it negative. And if it was, he would always put a positive spin on it. You're right. Anything else? I think it was the guests, too. The, sometimes the, the best ones were the, the ones that weren't stars. Yeah, oh, yes. Oh, is that huge? Uh, if you didn't hear what he said, he said a lot of the times it was the guests. And it wasn't even the ones that were stars. It, it was the everyday folk or unusual folk uh, that he would have on that, that made it so special uh, and so funny, too. You'll see that in a couple of minutes as well. Timing. He was a master of timing. A master. And if you think about it, isn't that what a magician is? Right. If you think about it, isn't that what a ventriloquist is too? To be an effective game show host, it's all about timing. You know, so all of those things that he did to lead up to his moments on The Tonight Show served him well. Somebody said something over here, no? He could, oh, that's huge, that's huge. He could really ad-lib. That is so very important when you do a show like that night after night. It really wasn't scripted. I mean, except for the skits and his monologue, but the, the time that he shared with the guests, that to me was some of the best because how fresh it was and, and how it was never scripted. 100% correct. Thank you, everybody. Anybody else? Self-deprecatory Yes, 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 the type of humor that he, he displayed. It, it really wasn't kind of like humor today, he right? He chop himself up in, fr in front of the camera. Yes, he yeah. had a good sense of humor about himself, 100% correct. And actually, some of the guests, uh, not always his best friends, but just people who had met him for the first time, would go in and, and make a joke out of him, and he was the first one who would be laughing continuously. Yeah, very good point, very good point. Uh, so, <laughs> I think a lot of it had to do with his personality. He was gentle and non-intrusive. And that's huge when you have a show like that. He knew the balance of not doing too much and not doing too little as well. Uh, many on TV folks don't know how to walk that fine line. And it must have worked because I think America is pretty choosy about who they let into their bedrooms every night for no less than 30 years. 30 years, think about that. That's how long <laughs> The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson was on the air. Uh, that is a successful career, don't you think? And here are some unusual things about the great Johnny Carson that I bet you don't know, or at least some of them. Johnny wrote two comedy books. Johnny was revealed to be secretly writing jokes for David Letterman's uh, late night show five days before Johnny's death. Interesting, huh? Johnny turned down an offer by Mel Brooks to play the Waco Kid in Mel's Blazing Saddles film of 1974. 
Johnny also co-wrote the theme of The Tonight Show with songwriter Paul Anka in 1962. How does that tune go? <laughs> the theme song, uh-huh. Yeah, do it a little louder because they seem to have forgotten. <clears throat> Yes. How about a round of applause? <laughs> Amazing talent we have here tonight. You folks don't need me. No. Yeah, and and so <laughs> <laughs> she says no. How would you like your hair dyed blonde? <laughs> Why can't she remember? She's sitting next to your mother. <laughs> I know. I know. And you should, you should talk to her about the way she treats uh, me. I will. Yeah, I, I think you should. <laughs> but you made a very valid point about Paul Anko, which was? He, he gets money, uh, I mean dollar signs, every time he hears that song. Yes, Paul Anka used to love it because of the royalties. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that song played every Three night nights. for 30 years. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Paul Anka probably didn't need to sing another note for the rest of not only this life, but many others after that. Uh, Johnny was given the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1992. He received the Kennedy Center Honors in 1993. The very first guest on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson on October 1st, 1962, was Groucho Marx. And you already heard that the very last guest, well, she, I guess she was kind of the last guest, was Bette Midler, was Bette Midler. Johnny was considered for the part of Rob Petrie on what famous 1960s sitcom? Dick the Dick Van Dyke Show. He was considered for that role before Dick Van Dyke got it, and it was called The Dick Van Dyke Show. Johnny would also guest star on two episodes of Get Smart. Get Smart, great Mel Brooks TV show. He appeared in one movie where he played himself in 1964 along with Connie Francis in a flick called Looking for Love. The flick bombed, and Johnny would never appear in films, at least with that long type of a role again. Johnny was a huge fan of Elvis Presley. Johnny also hated to be interviewed by the paparazzi, and they were always following him around for some reason or other, but no more so when it was announced that he would be assuming the reins of The Tonight Show. So that he wouldn't have to be interviewed by a reporter, he created answers to all the questions that they would ask him in uh, an interview scenario and pass them out to the reporters and never appeared for an interview. And here are the answers. Not a bit of truth to that rumor. Yes, I did. I can do either but prefer the first. Only once in my life, both times on Saturday. <laughs> no. Kumquats. I can't answer that question. Turkestan, Denmark, Chile, and the Komandorsky Islands. As often as possible, but I'm not very good at it yet. Toads and tarantulas. I need more practice. It happened to some old friends of mine, and it's a story I'll never forget. Interesting, huh? While The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson was on the air, Johnny obviously dominated late night television. Even though they tried, no one could hold a candle to him. Those that tried, I'm sure you remember, were Steve Allen. David Brenner, Jimmy Breslin, Dick Cavett, Chevy Chase, Merv Griffin, Arsenio Hall, Robert Klein, Ron Reagan Jr., Joan Rivers, Pat Sajak, Ross Schaefer, and David Suskind, just to name a few. Can anybody guess who was uh, the longest uh, cast member, in other words, the cast member of The Tonight Show that appeared on that show the longest? 
in that 30 years. It wasn't Doc Severinsen, but you're close. Skitch Henderson. Uh, not Skitch Henderson, Tommy Newsom. Tommy Newsom, uh, the fill-in band leader who also played in the Tonight Show Orchestra. Uh, it's no joke that with a schedule like Johnny had, that he would eventually need some weeknights off. You might remember that he started taking Monday nights off, and uh, he, in 1983, asked Joan Rivers to fill in for him. Uh, can you name some other guest hosts of The Tonight Show, who appeared in Johnny's absence when he was taking some nights off. Ah, very good, that's right. Joey Bishop, he appeared as a guest host 177 times. Did I hear something else? Don Rickles, you bet. How about Bob Newhart, 87 times. John Davidson, 87 times. David Brenner, 70 times. McLean Stevenson, 58 times. Jerry Lewis, 52 times. And David Letterman, 51 times. Jay Leno as well, but not that often. Just when Johnny Carson became a permanent family fixture in many of our households, it was all of a sudden 1992. There was Johnny sitting on a stool, looking right into the camera, saying the following words. And so it has come to this. I am one of the lucky people in the world. I found something I always wanted to do and have enjoyed every single moment of it. I want to thank the gentlemen who have shared this stage with me for no less than 30 years, Mr. Ed McMahon, Mr. Doc Severinsen, and you people for watching. I can only tell you that it has been an honor and a privilege to come into your homes all these years and entertain you. And I hope when I find something that I want to do and I think you would like, I hope you would like, I will come back and that you'll be as generous in inviting me into your home as you have been. I bid you a very heartfelt good night. And then, he was gone. And the joyful noise and energy of those wonderful years suddenly stopped. Johnny Carson became a part of our lives without us even knowing it. It's as if he was always there for us, even though we might not have always been there for him. Bob Hope said that Carson's retirement was like, and I quote, a head falling off Mount Rushmore. <laughs> Bob goes on to say he's had a profound impact on millions of lives. He changed people's sleeping habits, sex habits, and their midnight eating habits as well. I will say that, sure, you saw him from time to time, but for the most part, Johnny Carson, after he left the show, knew when it was time to close the door. And close the door he did. Knowing when to shut off the lights and walk out of the door and close it is a very special gift, actually, folks, that many performers actually do not have. Johnny did. When he knew he could not give anymore, he graciously left us. Will there ever be another Johnny Carson? I, for one, and I can see it on your faces too, highly doubt it. It's almost as if America never got the chance to thank him for all the joy and laughter he brought to us each and every night for so many years. On January 24th, 2005, the great Johnny Carson would pass on of respiratory arrest arising from emphysema. He was 79 years of age. Folks, great men come and go, but the wise ones somehow know what they've left in their wake.
When I was preparing this presentation for you, I would often think, what must Johnny Carson be thinking as he turns on his widescreen surround sound TV where he is in heaven and watches what we're watching on TV down here? What must he be thinking? Probably what I'm thinking. That television nowadays has definitely changed, but I also believe that it hasn't. Many believe that television mirrors what's going on in our present day society, our present day culture. Or is it that what is presented on television then becomes mirrored in our present day society and our present day culture. Johnny Carson would probably agree with me when I say that this is an argument that will probably go on for time immemorial. But what is really timeless is one great man who had the courage and joy to be nothing more than himself and in so doing, he has won a true place not only in the heart and soul of our country, but in many of our own hearts and souls as well. Thank you.